uh, 14 through 17, it says, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, though Jesus, uh, uh, through, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together uh, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And so that's a, another one. And then another one is 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51 through 52, where it talks about the resurrection and the twinkling of an eye, that event where it happens so fast that you just you can't even put it together. And then we... Uh, we did some overviews of the theories, discussed some terms, uh, discussed uh, some of the assumptions that goes with it, and uh, I, you know, all of those things I was doing to to train our mind. You know, there's uh, especially when we're dealing with non-essential doctrinal issues. You know, you got to really train your mind to think about things in a way that realizes uh, that you have. Uh, like, and I just talked about it in prayer there with the humble convictions. Humble convictions. Because when it's a non-essential issue, uh, it, it's just like, you got to realize other people are going to see a non-essential view in a different way. And they have a different understanding. So you just always got to be humble about that. So this morning, it, it, thinking about what I'm convinced of, uh, we're going to go over... Uh, Three, uh, three different reasons that I would believe uh, that in the pre-trib rapture theory. And again, I'm using the word theory because it's, it's all a proposal. It's a best guess at the moment. And I always want to remind us of that. So we're going to look at where uh, God likes to rescue. Uh, where there's a, a, another name for this, uh, the revelation period, uh, if you will, the Jacob's distress. And then we're going to take a look at the absence of the church. And then uh, we're going to discuss some more issues. I'll tell you which ones I'm going to hit next week at the very end. But the first thing we're going to look at is that one of my favorite things is, is for me that convinces me that the pre-trib rapture is because God has a pattern of rescuing uh, before periods of judgment and trials. So he has this pattern. It's just like and many of you are familiar with it. Uh, it gives us a record of a God who graciously comes to the rescue of those who are his. He, and so uh, from the beginning of, in Genesis, we observe God who uh, rescues folks from a devastating judgment and he, that he enacts on mankind. Um, so I'm going to go over a list of some of these. Uh, they're a high-level view, so I'm not going to go to each scripture reference, especially since we don't have an overhead. It makes it really hard. Uh, but some of it is just the part of the story. So you just got to be familiar. If you, if much of these are from the book of Genesis, of all things. So go back and everybody loves to read the book of Genesis. They do it <laughs> once a year as they start out their Bible reading until they get to Leviticus. And it's like, oh! And then they, so everybody reads, reads Genesis again and again. So the, one of the first rescues may surprise you. I look at one of the first rescues as... The seed of the woman. You're like, what are you talking about? Well, when Adam and Eve sinned, uh, God talks to them and he comes to, he tells Adam, first he tells the snake, man, you really messed up. And he tells Adam, guess what? You know, because of what you did, this is what's going to happen. You're going to have to work hard. You're going to be sweating it out. But then he comes to the woman and he says, you know, it's just like, hey, yeah, you're going to have trouble in childbirth now, but this childbirth it's got something going on, and he says, there's going to be a seed from you that will crush Satan. And so that very seed, and you're like, well, Robbie, how does this talk about rescue? Because see, uh, right from the very beginning, God knew we, humanity, would need rescue. And it would be a gracious rescue. He was going to do it. He, he could, could have said, all right, Eve, here's the deal. You're going to give birth to kids. Adam, this is what you're going to have to work your butt off. And now this is the idea. 
and you have to earn your way to me. He could have said that. But he said, no, I have got a plan already. And I'm going to, from the seed of the woman, somebody's going to come and rescue you. So there it is. That, he sets the pattern right out the gate. Then, of course, one you everybody's familiar with is Noah and his family. Rescued from the worldwide flood. And God said, hey, he's looking around. He's like, man, none of these guys want to do good at all. They're all doing evil, evil, evil all the time. And so he says, that's it. I'm going to have to clean this place up. And he does it with, with the worldwide bathwater all the way around to wipe everybody out. But he rescues somebody. And he, he comes to Noah. And he says, Noah, I'm gonna, here, I want you to build this ark. And he gives him instructions. Gives them instructions to do it for 120 years, building it. And so, uh, and the rain had not come down yet, and, and it was, but it was interesting. So he gives him instructions of preparation. And we see that throughout the Bible, too. We are always told to prepare. And Noah is told to prepare. <clears throat> and then what's interesting is I like the idea is... Folks are seeing what he's doing. They had 120 years. That's what always little bit. It's like, well, sometimes we look, well, it isn't fair. God isn't fair. Not everybody's going to hear the gospel. That's always the thing that the people will say. Well, God just isn't fair. God is totally fair. He, it, it, he just, he'll, he'll reach you if you want to be reached. He will. And here, 120 years, people will tell, hey, it's going to come to an end. It's going to come to an end. They're like, yeah, right, big weirdo. It's like, he has to say, hey, that's what's going on. And, and, but, and then what's interesting is so he prepares, gets all this boat going, but in the end, it was God who rescued them. And you say, well, what do you mean? Well, in Genesis 7, 16, it, the rain started to come down. They're all piling in the boat. But uh, unlike every other structural engineer, they're like, oh, by the way, who's going to close this door? <laughs> We got a door. You, know, so they, they, you always look at the kid. Well, Noah's looking at the kid. Were you all raised in a boat? No. It's like, they're like, God comes and says, and says as, they, as those and those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. The Lord really ultimately did the rescue. Because if they had that door open, guess what boat is sinking? It ain't going to be very water worthy. So the Lord held it shut. And he held it shut the whole time. That's something to keep in mind. He doesn't just shut it and they're all like, and they're okay, nail it in. The Lord has it latched the whole time. And so the Lord delivered them from that judgment. Then there's Lot's family. Lot, of course, comes from the story where uh, God promised Abraham uh, that he would uh, you know, save a righteous person from a place that he was going to judge, which was Sodom and Gomorrah. So God had looked down and he said, man, these guys, they're, they're bad. This whole valley, this whole area. And when you think of Sodom and Gomorrah, you have to remember there's more than just, some have suggested more than just two cities. There's probably about five different cities all in that one area that were re getting judgment. And so... Uh, Abraham finds out about it. He makes a wheel and deal with God. He says, God, well, how many people will you say? It's just like, well, I'll say this many. And then he's like, well, God, how about this many? He whittles it right down to where he's like, okay, at least maybe you'll save my, my, my nephew down there. And what's interesting is so God goes down there. He sends a couple of his angels down there to save the day. And what Lot and family... It, First, they cause this whole stir of trouble down there. But then when they're taking him out, this is interesting. He, the angels practically have to drag them out yes. of the city. Mm -hmm. Something we don't keep in mind. It's just like, it's like, come on, let's go. And they, for uh, the ultimate foot dragger, oh, no, I'm really lucky. In fact, what, the wife totally turned around. And God cursed her by making her become a pillar of salt. Yeah. But it's just like they just were so resistant to even want to get out. And that's, to me, that's something when I think of a, a, a pre-trib rapture, I think of like when God said he's going to catch us out. 
I know that there's going to be Christians in my mind that are going to be still enamored with this place. Like, I'm going, but Lord, I had so many plans. You know, I just like, and that's, that's going to be part of the thinking. It's just there. That's why Jesus constantly had to say, be prepared, stay awake, do these kind of things. Uh, and so that's where it, it also comforts me where God will rescue even those that are not exactly the most godly people. Because Lot, is the, we see his story. He was first camped outside the city, then he gradually works his way in. So he's in the city. In fact, he's one of the city leaders. Uh, kind of questionable there. Then I look at another rescue, really, kind of different. And this one was Jacob's family. Jacob's family was rescued by God. And how did he rescue him? Is it some big divine thing? Some big picture thing? A little bit more subtle. Kind of painful for one person. You know, uh, he rescued his family through the betrayal of one of the brothers. And that brother was Joseph. Joseph even saw the image. He said, hey, this is what's going on. Family didn't really care for his dreams too much because he's like, hey, look at this. You guys are all going to bow down to me. He's like, oh, yeah? That's the way you're going to play it? And the brother's like, man, we got to get rid of this guy. He's just like, he's annoying. And so they did. They betrayed him and sold him off. But everything was all part of God's plan to rescue them in a time of famine when they all would have starved to death. And what's even better is not only did, was it about rescuing them from starving to death, but God also had a plan of making them a nation. They had to become a people. So that was all part of it, all part of what God was doing. And so there it is, a, a, a rescue. And then you could go on and on from there. The, the, I think of Israel when they were rescued from Egypt. And God came and did the work totally you know, with that. Uh, then throughout that time, Israel from his enemies, there's time after time where they're like, Lord, they're coming to get us, and they're way bigger than we are. God shows up and does the deed. Does the deed. It's kind of interesting. I don't know if I'm going to get to it or not, but I was talking to Bill. I was in this study looking at the trumpet, and uh, there was one of the times where it's in the Bible where it says that the trumpets were instructed to be blown uh, to come to God, ask God to come to aid, which was very interesting. And it's like, it, and then there was one time, an example where it, during the Civil War of Israel and, and Judah, where they were fighting, and I believe it was Judah was losing the battle, and the priests blow the horns. And then it says, God shows up to win the day. And so it's truly God loves to rescue. That's, and to me, that's always encouraging on the big picture for you and I. You know, it's just like, we, I must always remember, it's just like, yes, God is going to bring judgment. He's going to judge sin. But for many of us, he judged sin already on the cross. Jesus took our judgment. And so when we believe that, when we trust that he has taken our judgment already, we are rescued. And we have to remember that God loves to rescue us. He's not like, okay, you trusted him on the cross, but well, I'm ready to kick you out anytime now. That's not the way he, he rolls. He is like, you're in my son now. You're in my family. I love to rescue you. And so, to me, that's one of the reasons I'm convinced about a pre-tribulation rapture event. Well, I'm also convinced of a pre-trib rapture because the seven-year period is about Israel and not the church. All right, so I'm convinced about this. God delivers, but I do know that he also disciplines. Hebrews chapter 12 makes it very clear about discipline. Um, but when we think about the seven-year tribulation, we should wonder, why is it seven years? Why all the different signs? 
Why all the Jewish symbology in all of this? Well, in my mind, God rescued Israel, but there was something else going on with his people. God recognized that even though they would be rescued, they would continue their unfaithful relations with their rescuer. So this was going on with Israel, and that, of course, that's why they got in trouble. And this was, what's interesting is they were taken away uh, and taken to Babylon, some taken to Assyria. They were all dispersed. And, uh, but there was going to be a time that would be coming, and what's interesting is Jeremiah foretold this in Jeremiah chapter 30, and he called it a time called Jacob's Distress. Jacob's distress. Now, the reason I focus in on that is because he didn't call it the church's distress. He didn't call it the saint's distress. He didn't call it the elder's distress. He called it Jacob's distress. So it was this time, and of course, Jacob, anybody that's read their Bible, read Genesis, what did Jacob name? He, he got given a new name. What was it? Israel. And so this is about Israel's distress. And so it's interesting, in chapter 30 of Jeremiah, he actually goes over the restoration of Israel. And so part of this, this whole event that I see is all about them. Uh, Jeremiah 30, verse 7 is where we get this phrase from. Where it says, alas, or gee, it's just like that day is so great, there is none like it. It is a time of distress for Jacob. Yet he shall be saved out of it. And so it's aiming at them in my mind. That's where it's just, I'm convinced it's aiming at that group, the Israel group. And that day, of course, is the 70th week of Daniel. We talked about that at the very beginning, kind of kicked this off at, the, at Luke 21 to really try to bring that focus. And you'll see that I come back to it. So I encourage you, go back to Daniel chapter 9 all the time. Verse 24 through 27, really get a good grasp of that because that's a timeline that, that God's given us. It was, remember, Daniel was seeking prayer. He's like, he was in Babylon. The 70th year was showing up because they were saying, hey, you're going to go there for 70 years. 70 years is coming and it looks like it's going. He's like, God, what are you doing? What is going on? And he gets that vision, a vision of 70 weeks. But the, in the vision, we discovered that the 70th week, there's an interruption between it. Something happens. And of course, we see uh, that that's where uh, Christ was, the Messiah would be killed. Another figure would supplant him for the period of one week, that 70th week. So that's where I'm convinced that the book of Revelation is all about that 70th week. It's a detail of that seven year period of time. So since it's all about that and it's about Jacob, about Israel, that's where I'm convinced that the book of Revelation is all focused in on Israel. The last reason I'm gonna to discuss today is that I'm convinced in a pre-trib rapture because Jacob's distress excludes the church. Now, when I was writing this, I was thinking, you might, think, you might be thinking, it's like, well, Robbie, that is kind of what you just said. But there's a subtle difference here uh, because, of, and I'll explain why. It looks like it's the same, but it's kind of different. So how do we know that God is doing something different like excluding the church? Well, this is kind of a, a subtle thing that not everybody realizes, but when you read chapters 1 through 3 of Revelation, you will encounter the word church or the words around it 19 different times from chapters 1 through 3. But chapter 4 onward, all the way till you get to Revelation 22, 16, which is at the very, very end, the word for church, which is ecclesia, like where we get the, the word ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical, you know, it's the same Greek kind of term, that ecclesia is just not there. They talk about saints, they talk about the elect, but the word for church is not there at all. And to me, that's, that's pretty significant. Why would that be? 
Uh, you know, and even that last word, when it's, it's like the last part of it where he's like, I'm writing this to the current churches. Because that's what he's getting in the first chapter 1 to 3. He's talking to specific churches. And so uh, part of this I was thinking about, well, why would he do this? What makes it different? Why would that matter? Well, see, most of Scripture, a lot of it's prophecy, but a lot of it's history. And the number one group in the history is Israel. That's the, that's the group that God is interacting with almost all the time in that. And, uh, but you and I know, and we're part of it, uh, an, an unspecified term of existence, which we're in right now, is called the church age. We've had 2,000 years. Uh, but you know how much church age history is in the Bible? The book of Acts. <laughs> That's about it. And, you know, we don't keep adding to the book. Because really, if you look at the way some people think that the Bible is added to, uh, that we would just keep adding, we would have these all these extra Bible books that would say the continued acts of the medieval church, the continued acts of this and acts of this and acts of that, and all down the line. But we didn't. You know, it's just like, nope, this is all the action we needed to have right here. Tells us everything we need to know, and that's it. So that tells me one thing. It's just like, God loves us, but he's like, hey, in history, I'm still paying attention to the first group that I'm really dealing with, which was Israel. And so uh, he addresses them specifically. That's why he does it in, in, inside those chapters from chapter 4 all the way to the end of chapter 22, he doesn't mention the body of Christ. Now, he mentions some individuals, like I said, the saints are sometimes measured or talked about, the elect or something, but it's seen on an individual basis, not as a group, not as a core. See, that's the thing is, right now, like, and we always talk about this all the time, you know, are, is, is this church, Grace Christian Fellowship, the body of Christ? We, most of you, and I would hope that you would say yes, but no, because all around this city, there's other parts of the body of Christ are meeting all across this nation, all around this world. The body of Christ has met today. Some of them, they're already in tomorrow, but, uh, but they're meeting because everyone who believes is the body of Christ, is the church. That's why uh, Bill was up, we were talking about how good it's looking. And it's like, well, we always got to remember, this is just a building. This building is, is not the church. Church is us. The church is everyone that believes. And so that's, to me, it's just like, that's why when we think about the church being an entity in and of, of its own self, that's why, to me, it's important that if that is not included in those portions, it, that there's a purpose to that. It's like, no, this particular entity, this body of Christ as a corporation, if you will, isn't going to be there. Now, I believe, now, that, now this is where it gets weird sometimes. There's, there are some people that feel like not too many people are going to become Christians in the end times. I'm not so convinced about that. I'm thinking that a lot of people are going to come to Christ, especially right away. When they're like, oh my gosh, I missed the rapture. Whenever it is, they're going to be <laughs> the only ones that are, if the post truth rapture is the rapture, then yeah, nobody's going to have a chance. It's too late now. But if there's a, you know, pre or mid or partials in there, if that's the way it is, uh, I imagine a lot of people are going to be like, hey, uh, Uncle Joe was just here and now he's gone. <laughs> and then it's so what's going on? And so people are going to be wondering. I keep the, I think about at home leaving the you know that little packet of papers like if I if, if this if this happens if a worldwide <laughs> disappearance of people happen this is what happened to help people understand you know just like the, to to be able to prepare you know just like you know, it's just like or I could like if a worldwide people disappeared then the next page says too late sucker. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, but you know, it, it, it'd be funny. Oh, then the next page is I'd give some instruction. But, you know, <laughs> but that's the I, to me, it's just like I am convinced that that is meaningful for something. That the church not being there says something. And that, that's why 
I prefaced it, because when I was thinking about teaching this, I was thinking about, well, I could just go off a list, but I was like, you know, I want to have a list that kind of follows and makes some sense of where I'm going. Because it, to me, that's the whole thing. It's just like, I'm looking at a big picture kind of idea. So, uh, that is also part of that is, is I'm thinking about the idea that God, in his summation of this, this 70th week, remember the, the 70th week is, is another era. He's bringing in a new era. So things are changing. That's, that's part of the thing you have to, to realize that he's bringing an end to one and bringing a new one. And even then after that, remember, if we read our Bibles, there's a thousand year period where Jesus is going to reign on the earth. But even that is going to come to an end. And then there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And I don't know what fabulous, magnificent things those are going to bring. And what that's going to be. You know? Remember, I, I, I'm not convinced that we're just going to like, sit around and do nothing. He's going to have us doing things. He's going to be doing whatever we need to do, whatever that's going to be. Which will be awesome. So, there you go. So that's a couple reasons there. Uh, now... Next week, I'll probably cover a little bit more about wrath and discipline, because I think that's all part of the question, too. I'm going to talk about the, the, the white horseman of the first seal, because I think that's important. And then I'm going to talk, and some of us are, are aware of this, that I was kind of given a, a, just a, a, a jump start on this, was uh, looking at Jewish wedding customs. Hmm. which I thought was very interesting uh, to shed some light on this. And then I'm probably going to wrap it up from there. There's probably more reasons that I could come up with, but we'll have to hit those down the line. Uh, but before we conclude today, uh, I was given a side question here uh, that to ask since we're talking about raptures and resurrections and stuff like that. And the question came up, it's just like, so Paul... Uh, uh, spoke of, of death for himself as, as de and, and he says I'm desiring to be away from the body but at home with the Lord and this comes from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 6 through 9 so he's talking about he wanted to be he's like I'm here but I'd rather be there and then the, the question's like well so now if when Paul died or if any of us die today well what does that mean is are we Will we have a new body right then, or how will we exist? Well, this is actually, the, it, when you look back at it, it's the, the subject matter is the subject matter of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That's where he talks about a resurrection, but it hasn't happened yet. It, 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 even if you look at the, the Bible and the, and the seals, it talks about folks that were waiting, hanging out there. And so whatever it means, when people die, we're going to be in heaven, but we will not have our, our made-for-heaven body yet. I like saying it that way. Because Jesus even, or maybe Jesus didn't, but somewhere in the scripture he talks about that flesh and blood cannot, in, cannot inherit the, the kingdom. But some have said that, uh, what are these, the, the flesh and bone. So some, some have suggested that phrase, flesh and bone is like a different body. I don't know about that, uh, per se, that's possible, but I think the whole idea is we're going to get a new body. That resurrection body, that made-for-heaven body, will happen at that point, but while we're waiting, it's not like we're like, you know, uh, there's some to believe we're like soul asleep, or we're just sleeping in the grave. No, our bodies are, wherever, wherever the particles of our body might be, because, you know, some people got blown up. It's just like, how would they come back? Well, God knows exactly how to bring them back. You know, so I've never been worried about that. Just like, so it says everybody's got somewhere where they're at, you know, they've been decomposed and wiped out. And so God will bring them back at that time. And so I hope that answers the question. So, yeah, you're going to have a different kind of body, a spirit, a spirit body, yeah, but you're not haunting anybody. None of that action. You know, just like, uh, yeah. Not down on that. So, 
So in conclusion of this week, what I, you've noticed a lot of my phrases, I've been trying to, uh, as I said earlier, talk about my convictions, what I'm convinced in. And what I want to encourage you today with is, what are you, what are you convinced about in this subject? Not necessarily that you're going to agree with me, but are you being convinced? Are you being convinced about something? Because when one is convinced, one develops conviction. So I want you to develop convictions because if you don't have convictions, then you're not convinced. That's the truth of it. And I want you to be convinced. As I said, not necessarily always agreeing with me, but I want you to study the word. Become convinced. I definitely want you to become convinced of essential things. There are some things that Christianity rises and falls on. Who Jesus is. What we think about the Bible. What we think about salvation. That There's things there that are essential. And there's some things that are not essential, kind of periphery stuff. But in all of that, every one of you should become convinced about something. Like I said, on the non-essentials, we may not see things eye to eye, but see, at least become convinced about it. That way, you're because when you get convinced and get convictions, your convictions will guide you. Your convictions will guide you. Father God, we just uh, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for the big picture stories that you've given us in there that tells us I think about your character, what, how you rescue us, your uh, big picture stories of Israel and the church, and uh, the, I think distinctions that are there, because how you're working with us and them, and that your plan that you have made. Uh, and I, I realize even one of the things that I talked about, like I think is part of Israel, and the Lord's reminding me is that. God made Israel a lot of promises, a lot of specific promises. And so I think they're going to come true. I think God's good for his word to make those promises happen. So I think he didn't make those for the, us, the church. He made them for them. And so, Lord, and that's okay. <laughs> Personally, as a Gentile, I'm just really stoked that you invited us to become your kids too. And so, Lord, I just praise you for that. And I pray, Father, for all of us today and those around us, family and friends, Father, I pray that they would become convinced about Jesus Christ, who he is and what he has done, and faith in him. So we ask this, we ask this humbly in you. Amen. Let's stand and worship the Lord. Sing it.